I have a number of questions, but before I go, are there any questions in the audience? Do we have a mic? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, my question is uh, specifically on Terranet, and I was wondering if you have looked at or even considered um, whether this PPP model would be applicable in developing countries, and why or why not? Uh, I, I, I would say it's got some applicability, and, and I think about it in two ways. There's the, uh, the, the PPP model as Terranet was originally established, which uh, puts, puts the government and, uh, and the private consortium together and you share the risk. Whereas uh, the model as it has evolved today into a consortium, the risk transferred to the private sector. So um, I in both cases in our world, it, it comes down to the risk and the assessment of risk, which uh, goes to um, technology risk, uh, political risk, economic risk, and uh, well, I think you could, you could set it up if you had the confidence that the commitment was there. Uh, the economy will sustain the, the business model within the PPP, then uh, you know, those are the mechanics that, that drive the change and, uh, and advance it. And you'd be able to bring the capabilities to bear through that private sector component. David Mendelian. Hi, uh, my question is to both um, Canada and Australia. My understanding is that in both those countries you have First Nations groupings who live on land which is separate. Um, and I understand that that's c communal land. And I was just wondering how that fits into the land registry system, if at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, w we do. Um, we, we actually have a, quite an interesting uh, land rights issue in Australia, which I'm sure you probably know more more in detail information on it than I do. Um, but we, we have a lot of um, Aboriginal communities on Crown land um, that have rights over the land. And one of the, um, you know, we have some of the issues that, that I see in the South African um, um, examples where, you know, how do you prove your rights when it's, when it's communal rights. So, um, it's it's quite a complicated structure, um, and that while they have rights to live on the land, and government provides a lot of services. So at the moment, government government provides schooling, housing, health, um, but it's it's an issue that I don't think we've got nailed yet. Um, we have multiple service providers that go out to some of those very very remote areas, and some of them are just if, if you went there, you wouldn't see anything there. It's um, but the very strong connection to land for the people is important. So um, we do recognise all of that land through Crown land in the title register uh, and how it's managed is communally by individuals uh, with services provided by government at the moment. In, in Canada, um, Aboriginal lands are generally managed federally. So this, this would be the reserves uh, and they are communal. Um, or leased, so that there would be a leasing infrastructure within that. So they're not managed within the provincial context or by the provincial registry. Um, and, and the registry services or the registry um, integrity, I would say, is light. But there's lots of conversations about introducing a titling system into uh, um, Aboriginal lands. I think the other area that comes into play are, are lands that are in dispute. So Aboriginal claims, would, would, which would be on titled land and the registry does come into play there as you're trying to define the scope of land, the extent of land, and, uh, and those rights. Front row, Peter and Yulia. Hi, thank you for uh, really interesting presentations. My question is to Jody and to Elizabeth. You both touched on the um, challenge of convincing 
different government agencies or government departments to share data with each other. Uh, and there's a clear case, of course, to be made for the sharing of data and for the kind of sum is greater than, or whole is greater than the sum of its parts of combining different data sets, making it interoperable, but we also know the challenges around getting different actors to share data with each other. I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of the backstory of how you succeeded in convincing these parties to play in the same sandbox. Yes, I could. Um, for us, before the agency started, it was very difficult for everybody to share data. Um, everybody held on to their data. Um, once the agency started, however, we were all in one place, so they had to share the data. Um, but the, the problem still occurs because there is actually work going on now to provide a government data sharing policy so that the other departments will also share with us um, to help to improve that database. It's still difficult um, because you have to also remember that some people earn from their data. And so when they put it into this big pool, we haven't quite figured out yet how to give everybody a little bit of the share of that pie. So it's still an ongoing problem that we are working through. Um, I guess in another few years, we'll sort that out. But it's been worked on. So we started, um, we have a thing in, in Western Australia called Wallace, which stands for the Western Australian Land Information System. Um, and we run another thing, oh, we love acronyms, doesn't this industry just love acronyms? Um, we also run a, a thing called the Shared Location Information Platform. So we've been in those two spaces for Wallace for over 25 years and uh, SLIP 13 or 14 years. And what we did was build the infrastructure and then start the conversations, um, well start the conversations and then try and convince people to make their data available. So through SLIP I think we've got almost 3,000 government data sets and we're able to, because of how um, we've developed the platform, you can have open and free data, you can have open data that the agencies um, charge back um, and you can also have data that's not available, that's I guess locked down data which agencies can look at but the public can't look at and we've been able to accommodate all of those things. Um, but have we got all of the data? So, no, we haven't. Um, our government has an open data policy and we have a location information strategy signed off by Cabinet, but there's no mandate. So every data set that we get available through SLIP is, is much um, relationship building, conversation, giving confidence that the data is going to be safe. Um, one of the things we found with our agencies is when you ask them why they won't share their data, they say because our data set's not good enough. And then you say, then you say to them, um, are you making decisions based on your data? And they say, oh yes, we're doing that. And you go, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Um, I guess the other thing that I see in WA, we're coming off the back of a large mining boom. There's been a lot of money in the economy. Um, we don't have that. Our property market is the lowest it's been since the 80s. Um, we would be in serious trouble if we had not disru disrupted ourselves. Um, and what I'm seeing in government agencies, there's been massive cuts across the board to funding. And all of a sudden, people who didn't want to share data or wanted to have duplicate services are now coming and saying, you know how five years ago you said I could have, I, you know, I didn't need my 50 staff, you could provide the service. Do you want to have that conversation? So for us, as things get tighter, the opportunity actually increases. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the people who've had this bastion of, um, of staff that they've kept hold of are now going, we actually can't afford to duplicate services. So I think out of adversity comes opportunity if you're ready to take it. But it's, it's, it's a lot of relationship building and it's very, very time consuming. Um, and you've just got to keep at it because it's, you know, for the benefit of our citizens and our shareholder, it's the right thing to do. Hi, Peter Rabley again from Omidia Network. Thank you all for your presentation. It's a question for all three of you, and perhaps Elizabeth, if you would start. Um, as you went through the conversion process, how big a problem was fraud, both in the records and with staff? 
and how did you deal with it? And is it an ongoing problem, or have you largely seen that uh, dissipate? Thank you. Okay, for us, um, fraud was a problem in the registry. Um, missing documents, documents torn out of the big books, um, if any of you know what that registry looks like. And, um, and I think one of the reasons with fraud was because things took so long to be done that people paid people to get to out their matters quickly. We, because of the conversion we have done and we now have all the documents scanned and we have more security of data and we put in more secure systems um, and have, because we're still on a paper-based um, system, we put in watermarks in the documents, etc. It has made it a little bit more difficult for people to make their own titles because people did that. Um, doesn't make sense tearing it out of the book anymore because you don't see the book when you come into our offices. You now look at it on the on a computer screen. So that has improved quite a bit. There's no need to pay anybody to get out your documents because you can pay us and get it in one day, or you can wait two days and get it, or you can wait the normal time, which is five days. So there's a big improvement in turnaround time has assisted um, the whole matter of fraud being reduced drastically. Uh, in Ontario, before the, uh, the conversion process, um, the public would come to registry offices and could easily access a, a title book, so they could take it out. So if they wanted to rule off a mortgage or um, that that was a potential. I don't think it was uh, viewed as prevalent uh, when when a uh, a fraud affected um, you know a, a, an older homeowner that got a lot of attention, but it wasn't prevalent. What was unknown was mortgage fraud because the banks don't readily tell the world that you know there's there's been fraud on their properties. Um, but as, as the records became automated, they became secure, and, uh, and the government saw an opportunity to enhance that through the supporting processes, uh, and uh, in the mid-2000s enacted legislation that required uh, lawyers to register transfers of property. Um, they had to verify identity, so that was part of their function under their uh, practice procedures. Um, lawyers were not allowed to act on both sides of a transaction uh, unless they're in northern Ontario where the nearest lawyer was a thousand miles away. Um, so there were a number of, of things that could be actually put in place and enabled by the, the electronification of, of the processes and systems. So, um, I, I, you know, it still happens, you still hear about it, but I would say it's, uh, it's a more secure system and process today. Um, but occasionally people, if they want to set out to do it, they, they may find a way. Yeah, I think si similar um, for us, it was, certainly wasn't prevalent, um, but the work through e-conveyancing and now uh, automated land registry, the e-conveyancing work has um, been done with all the, all the um, registrars, the title registrars actually agreeing that e-conveyancing is the way forward and one of the reasons for that is the security that it, that it gives. Um, and so our new land registry that we've developed to fit with that, um, it's certainly our belief and our registrar's belief that the more you automate and um, go to an electronic model, the more secure it is. But I agree with Elgin in as much as if people, when people want to fraud, they'll, f they'll try and find a way. But we're very aware. Um, we, we had a fraud a few years ago with some people copying documents and going through Africa where then was someone was away on holidays and um, that got a lot of media attention and um, certainly <coughs> things like verification of identity and other things uh, have been tightened since then. So it's not something that happens a lot but we are, once is too often, um, so we're acutely aware but really the move to electronic conveyancing and a electronic register actually um, decreases the ability for fraud. Two more questions. Hands up. Uh, th actually, three. We'll go one here, and then the lady, and then the gentleman in the back. Uh, Grenville Barnes, University of Florida. I'd like to come back to the idea of disruption, which you raised. It seems like most of you experienced not only disruptive technology, but disruptive economies, disruptive institutional factors, and it seems like that's not going to go away, particularly the technology side. Uh, and so, 
I'd like to ask each of you to perhaps identify your top three factors that you think provide resilience to land registration systems. Resilience to the system or resilience to, do you mean, do you mean the whole, the, the whole system? Right, okay. In the face of disruptive change, I guess. Um, so when I think about something like blockchain, um, I go back to the Torrin system where what's really important is the underpinning of that government guarantee of title and the integrity of it. Um, and so that, as a disruptor, you know, it's got to still um, support that, that, there, you know, somebody can't just start uh, a land registry in our context anyways uh, and say, this is where you're going to come now because it lacks that, that, that government underpinning and uh, um, integrity of that, that guarantee to title, which is why people are prepared to secure uh, money against property. Yeah, oh look, I think one of the things that's really important to the resilience of the whole system and the organisations is, I, I come back to the people, the pe it's really important that you spend, that we spend the time changing our culture and getting our culture ready for that, because I agree, um, disruption is everywhere um, and it's not going away. So a few years ago when I spoke to our staff and someone put their hand up and said, um, but we're change fatigued, we've had all this change and there's more change, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? Um, and I said uh, at the time, if you're change fatigued now, you probably need to get another job. Um, <laughs> and and that's, that's, you know, that's okay, it's actually okay for people to not be comfortable where they are, um, but they need to make a choice to leave then. So um, in my most recent rounds of, of staff talks where people you know, if, if, if people are getting up in the morning and dragging themselves into work and saying, I'm going to that place again, don't come, you know. Um, it's that, it really is that simple. Uh, it's a valid, it's absolutely a valid choice. Work somewhere where you can, you know, add value and, and that fits your values. And if that's not us, that's cool. There's plenty of other places that, that are. So the power of your people and what you can achieve, because at the end of the day, people... You can have all the technology in the world and you have governments and boards and but the people on the ground are the ones that give the customer service and make the change. So I would say don't underestimate the value of investing in your people and um, recognise the time that it takes to do it. But disruption is a, it's just here and, and there's not an industry that you can look at to go, how could this be more efficient? And um, as a personal plea, if anyone's got any great ideas about fixing how you get on an airplane in a, in a quicker way, um, <laughs> then I stand in those queues and I think, my God, where is the disruption when you need it? So. <laughs> um, for Jamaica, like Canada and Western Australia, we're also on the Torrent system, so we have that very secure base in terms of our titling. Um, I agree with Jodie that people is really the problem because you could do everything but if your persons are not properly trained, if they don't know how to speak to the customer, if they don't know how to calm down that customer who comes in, then disruption will continue. So we, we regularly put our staff, especially the frontline staff, back into training as to how to deal with the customers because there's always that one customer who will push the staff over the line so we try and make sure that they are prepared um, from a technical point or a legal point so that they can an answer the questions and be calm. Yeah, maybe two or three. Hi, I'm Tara, Tara O, uh, Pacific Forum CSIS. Um, this is related to the question that was asked earlier about fraud. Um, as we digitize more of the property information, um, it opens a new area of concern, and that is cyber attack, um, which is much beyond the, the, um, the fraud, uh, I believe. So as we talk about, when we usually think about cyber attack, we think of like infrastructure, and then we think of enormous you know, chaos that will create. But if uh, you know, property information is also um, the target of something like that, then that would also be a huge uh, disruption to the economy and you know, in many areas. Um, so how much of um, the mindset and the process of security uh, were involved in the, um, you know, in the creation of the, you know, digit 
digitization process um, as well as um, uh, you know currently ongoing. And I, I just want to throw in one example. You know, with, within the United States, the OPM Office of Personnel Management uh, held all kinds of personnel information, and they were stolen and um, massive, massive sto um, uh, theft. And um, in general, the that office is not in the the mindset of security wasn't present, but they held the the data. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, if you can talk about that aspect. Um, yeah, I, I can start. Um, certainly, we are in the mindset that it's really important and it needs to be secure. So um, a couple of things. One is when we when we developed our new registry service and it was cloud based, um, you know, we had quite a lot of questions come from people about you know the security of the cloud. Um, and our argument would be if it's in the cloud, it's actually more secure than if it's in a data center somewhere, um, which has a single point of failure, whereas w with cloud, you know, have seamless backup. So if something went wrong at one area, you can, you can move over. Um, I guess the other thing is to, you know, cyber security is an ongoing issue. And as soon as you fix one hole, yeah, you know, someone clever and smarter goes through another. But We've, we've made sure we've had independent verification. Um, we actually have one of the world's leading cyber security areas at one of our universities. So we've had independent verification as we built our system every few months, come and test. You do everything you need, <coughs> need to do. It's absolutely front of mind. Um, will that mean that it, we're never impacted? Pro possibly not, but, but certainly we recognise what we hold and the, and the importance of it. So. I think in, in a modern, digital, mobile world, um, you have to weigh up the, 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 pros, and, the pros and cons. And so in our, uh, I, I mentioned that we have uh, performance um, uh, standards that are around data integrity, security, uh, availability, and, and uh, ultimately we, we lose the company, we, le we lose the contract if, if um, if that happens. So we do take it very seriously. I would say it's uh, proportionally in terms of increases in investment over the last 10 years, security would be the highest growth in terms of the, the required investment um, just because of how technology is evolving. And uh, uh, you know, we, we do run data centers, but they run hot, hot, they're dual. If you've got backups, uh, we, can, we can duplicate. Uh, if everything was wiped out, we could still bring it back within a day's worth of the records um, and, uh, and do that within, within 24 hours. Uh, we run ethical hacking, so we hire somebody to try to hack our systems, and uh, we're audited by government um, regularly and thoroughly. So uh, it, it is a very, very high priority. It's also a high priority for us. Um, we actually back up outside of Jamaica. Um, so if anything goes wrong, we can pull back down our data. And interestingly, about two weeks ago, we were advised that there were threats on our system. So we actually locked down everything for about two or three days until they could sort out what was the problem. Um, this is a concern for, for us because we, we realize the value of the data that we have. And we also realize that going electronic titling is going to put us under more pressure to ensure that whatever systems we put in place, it can stand the scrutiny. Because I think people don't want to know that their data is out there. They want to be, they want to be sure that it is in a secure location. So we, it's something that we take very serious. So moving forward, it will increase in terms of our activities in that area. And then there's a question in the back. Um. I'm Michael Brown with the Chemonics International. And my question was just asked, and okay. it was responded to. But one <laughs> follow on to piggyback on that is stakeholder perceptions about cybersecurity. Um, is this uh, very much a concern in, in your three countries and um, thinking of the developing world? Uh, would you imagine that cybersecurity would be a bigger issue in, say, African countries or Asian countries than it is in northern countries? And maybe Jamaica might be a good place to start with that. But uh, just 
you know, how big an issue is cybersecurity to the various stakeholders that have to buy into electronic registries? Um, cybersecurity is a big issue for us. Um, lawyers are especially very, very concerned that the whole aspect of the whole protection of the data is, is at the forefront of our minds. Um, but, but as I said previously, it, this is something that is fairly new for us. Um, we have always stored our data outside of Jamaica because, you know, we are subject to natural disasters. And so, um, and, cyber, and cyber threats are, you know, they occur. So we, we just need to be aware of what it is we're looking for and to ensure that our staff is also aware that certain things they can do can bring the threats into our agency. So we, we're working on it. I think it's changed over time, uh, the perception, certainly in, in the early days when uh, computers were relatively new and lawyers didn't think you could hack into a typewriter. So um, it, it, it's evolved though, and I think today it's, it's kind of a table stakes. They expect, uh, they expect that security people will, uh, will get a health card online, they'll get driver's licenses online. So there's an expectation around the privacy aspect of, of the data. Um, but I think there's a general concern around the ability to hack and hold data hostage or, uh, or corrupt data, but that would be no different in this environment for other government databases as well, in my view. And, and so that's why you do take it seriously. And my, my only comment would be that um, I actually think there's an opportunity for developing companies to um, learn from the mistakes we've made and to leapfrog a, a whole lot of um, a whole lot of the processes and systems and things that we've been through. So um, I think security is probably one of those, but at, while people expect their data to be secure, they also be expect to get the service and to get their driver's licence online and to do everything online. So it's a, ba it's a balance. Um, it is absolutely forefront. I mean, you know, on the number one thing on what we, we have a... Um, our regist registry is backed by the state, so um, if things get if fraud happens, the state pays. So I can assure you, my shareholder, they don't actually care what all the other statistics are. If I've got um, if my fraud go fraud numbers go up, I can have the best set of figures on everything else, and it won't make any difference. Yeah, I want a lot of my questions have been asked. I just want to put a question to Elgin and, and Jody. Um, as your we, we've talked a lot about people and culture, and we've also talked about technology. And technology is not a panacea, but it's, as we're seeing in this conversation, you, you can't get away from it. And you're both heading into new geographies, Manitoba and New South Wales, to take your solution and ramp it up. And I'm just curious how you're thinking about that. How, you know, what, what technologies you might be deploying, your own or others, and, and just you're sort of getting, you know, reading these cases, one struck by the amount of time and effort it takes. And now you would, one would assume you have a mandate to move quickly. So how are you thinking about that and what, what technologies are going to be a part of it? Uh, certainly, I think the, the world's changed from what we'll call the pioneer days of, mm -hmm. of electronic land registry. Um, in Manitoba, I mean, we assumed operations two years ago. Uh, they were partially down the continuum on electronification, but within two years, we're delivering electronic conveyancing. And, uh, um, and actually, it, the system looks different than it does in Ontario, mm -hmm. um, and that's because the process and uh, the way records are managed is different. So it's got to be able to accommodate that. So there are elements underpinning that are just common to every registry system that we can use from Ontario, and we are. But when it comes to the, uh, the I'll call it the operational layer, the processing layer, uh, and, and the document construct for lawyers, um, that looks different, and that has to be customized. and. Uh, but the technology lends itself to be able to do that much more quickly and, uh, and be much more versatile today. Uh, look, and from our perspective, I guess um, Advara is, is the um, uh, tech partner of the New South Wales Consortium. So it's very, very early days and it's, um, I can't actually tell you what will be expected, but I can, I can make some um, observations, I guess, our new land registry system, which Advara has a license to, um, we know is what adds value to Advara and um, why, why we were included in the consortium. 
So it's not a great leap to go, well, they'll look to implement that system. For us, we think that will be, um, you know, both an interesting journey. We've, we've got a bit of a benefit from the rest of the world because we have a national electronic conveyancing system. It means that a whole lot of the lining up, lining the ducts up at the front end has already happened. So mm -hmm. we've developed our system. Um, we've tried to, even when talking to our own people on what they wanted, to create it as vanilla as we could so that we didn't need to do a lot of modification and customisation. So we're very confident that we're a very good fit for New South Wales um, and, and how that project goes will, will be a real, um, I guess, testament of how we can roll out to other jurisdictions. But just as a, at a bit, bit of a historical fact, our, our own old system, the West Australian system that we've just transitioned off, was actually the New South Wales system. So we know that underpinning, particularly in New South Wales, we have a lot of common elements. So, um, but it's still going to be still going to be an in interesting challenge. But that's what that's what the system was developed for. It was multi-tenanted for a reason, and that meant that we had to change our own thinking and our own our own business processes. So we didn't just um, turn into a system things that we were doing that actually weren't best practice. So we were very challenging right from the beginning on our own assumptions. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that land registry is uh, a part, it might be the beginning and the end of a, a real estate transaction, but there are a lot of different inputs and there's a lot of different stakeholders. Uh, there's a lot of different systems that uh, I think the, the opportunity to connect better and more efficiently with, with other parts of the, the real estate chain, the realtors, uh, the banks, uh, the lawyers themselves, in terms of the other functions they have to do to to conduct a, a land registration transaction. Um, so that's that's the next evolution that we're seeing is is where you're you're actually interfacing on multiple levels, and mm -hmm. it's it's part of a hub of coming in and being able to do uh, a real estate transaction uh, between a realtor and a lawyer and a lawyer and a bank all in one place. Okay. Yeah, thank you. With that, unfortunately. I think we are out of time. So lunch is outside. Thank you all for your attention and join me in giving a round of applause to the panel.